Hey everyone, welcome to the final installment of the Time Splitters Iceberg. I separated this from part 3 because the video was getting too long, getting up into the 45 minute range. I thought it'd be more digestible if I broke it up into the final section of the iceberg and some bonus content. Some parts that I found out while making the video, but weren't featured in the regular iceberg image. So the very last section is coming up, this has some of the most bizarre facts about the game, some fun theories, some crazy jokes, and a lot of fun content. I'm excited to get through it, so here we go. Let's start off with a classic line in the iceberg. Part 7. The Ocean Floor. Hope you're ready for some strange stuff, people. This is the very bottom of the barrel. Strangest theories, most baffling facts, and some very off-color jokes. Hope you guys enjoy the strange stuff you'll find here. Time Splitters 1 rare beta footage. Time Splitters 1 had the least amount of time in development out of any Time Splitters game. As such, there isn't a ton of beta footage you can find for it. If you dig around, especially on the IGN page, the IGN channel of YouTube, and the GameSpot videos on YouTube. I believe that there's a specific user who's been compiling them by the name of uh, Microchips. Yeah, he's the one who's made a playlist of Time Splitters 1 beta footage. It's hard to find screenshots from the development, and beta footage is usually either lower quality or tough to find. So, it's just kind of strange. Uh, it seems like Time Splitters 2 had the most prominent uh, beta coverage out of all the games. Time Splitters 1's a little tougher to find that stuff. Time Splitters feature perfect frame perfect code input. Now this is true. Time Splitters has a button code. You need to enter it in such an exact way that it's basically impossible to unlock. The code is L plus B, R plus D left, D right, D down, L plus D left, R and B, R and D up, L and X. This one's for GameCube specifically. And if you do it correctly, either patching it to not be frame perfect or being frame perfect, it'll show a little message in the top left of your game. It says, unlock features one. If you enter it again, it'll say unlock features zero. It's very strange. Not sure what the combo is for other consoles. I wasn't aware of this until uh, the user Jill brought this up to me, so thank you for bringing this to my attention. I'm not sure what I unlocked though. Time Splitters Future Perfect is Second Sight 2. Alright, this is a bit of a joke. Uh, playing through t Second Sight, some stuff from it really carried over into Future Perfect, like going through computers to access data, guards reacting and vocalizing instead of just doing grunts or saying hey when they notice you having arms visible in first-person view, stuff like that, and uh, using the using the temporal uplink to pick stuff up, sort of like John Vatic psychic powers. It all reminded me a lot of Second Sight and how it handled those gameplay mechanics. Viola's Uncensored Time Splitters Future Perfect Gallery. In Future Perfect, Viola has a gallery entry that just says censored, but in the preview version of the game, you can find the full uncensored one. Here it is. Time Splitters 2 button codes. Time Splitters 2 was long rumored to have button codes that you could enter to unlock stuff. The rumor is that Free Radical had included them, but deliberately not told anybody how to unlock them, because they wanted to keep things as impossible as possible. Well, nobody ever figured out what they were. The closest guess was that they were just a debug feature that were left in previous builds, but not in the final build, because there's a line of text in Time Splitters 2 that says, Congratulations, you unlocked a really secret feature. So if you need to unlock anything in the debug build of Time Splitters 2, you would just enter in whatever that button code is. 
But then later on, it turned out that the home front version of Time Splitters 2 had button codes that you would use to unlock different features of it, like all the story levels, the challenges, arcade. So it turned out, in a very roundabout way, Time Splitters 2 did have button codes. Strange how that was technically correct all along, just not in the way anybody expected. Arcade mode is purgatory. Alright, this is a joke. It basically those crazy ideas about like Ed and Eddie is in purgatory or stuff like that. Or any other theories of that sort. The idea is that arcade mode is just the characters reliving these crazy battles or the last moments of their lives before they died. And so every time you play a new match, they're reliving it and fighting for a chance to presumably make it out of there. But there's nothing to it. Darkest of Days and Time Shift are Time Splitters reboots. Again, another joke. If I had made it more recently, I probably would have said uh, Time Shifters and uh, Agent 64 Spies Never Die are also Time Splitters reboots. Both Darkest of Days and Time Shift involve time travel, and since there hadn't been a new Time Splitters game since 2005, it's easy to joke that they were meant to be reboots to the series, but they don't have any connection to it that I know of. All the Time Splitters games happen in different timelines. This I mentioned in the previous section, and it's a theory that has some believability to it. The Time Splitters games have always had a loose, kind of haphazard way of handling the story. Nothing wrong with that, but it means that there are some inconsistencies between returning characters. Like Cortez's ship in Time Splitters 2 is different than the one that he lands on Earth in Future Perfect. Or how Captain Ash seemingly looks differently between games, how Harry Tipper has a different voice in each game and acts differently in each game, where he's more of a hippie in a future perfect, he's a Clint Eastwood type in Time Splitters 1, and he's a suave secret agent in Time Splitters 2, or why some of those inconsistencies pop up, like Cortez not knowing who Harry Tipper is despite having uh, Fought, despite having inhabited his body in two. Or why there's only like certain species of time splitters in each game and none of them return. It's because they all happen in different timelines. Nothing actually connects. So every game is sort of self-contained. And it kind of works. It's just like, so if a character returns, it's an alternate timeline version of that character. It would explain why... Lady Jane was Captain Ash's companion in the first game, but in 2 and Future Perfect it was the Jungle Queen. That's a theory. There's some evidence for it, but you could give or take it. Warzone is a post-World War III dictatorship run by Kalos. That's right, I've been hinting at this theory for a while now, so I'm gonna get into it. Kalos in Time Splitters Future Perfect had this insane plan to start a nuclear war using a nuclear missile from the French. He wanted to kickstart World War III and he was already making plans to run his own country. He was making money for it and everything. Well, it's possible if you run out of time in the level for the missile to go off and to fire. Presumably this would kickstart World War III and probably destroy a lot of Europe NATO and the Warsaw Pact and all that. This would have given Kalos room to set up shop anywhere he needed to, get his troops together, and form a country of his own. He's already got money, he's already got resources, an armed force. He'd be able to easily establish himself in a very disrupted Europe. And Warzone is definitely a bombed out looking area. It's got that Eastern European look to it, sort of like how Kalos and his men have, like, those accents. His men sound very Russian and future perfect. And, yeah. So, t Warzone, it's called Stapelonia. Presumably that's what Kalos would have called it. It's not sure, I'm not certain if the outskirts of the country are the war zone, or if the country itself is still bombed out. But the whole crazy idea is that the area you're fighting at is territory run by Kalos. 
in the bad ending of his levels in Future Perfect. The Central Powers won World War I. This is another kind of loose theory. Uh, there's, if you really squint and stretch some facts, you can sort of see where it's coming from. This stems from some weapon choices in the games and the, some of the circumstances in Future Perfect. Time Splitter's Future Perfect. The games make it seem like uh, the Scotland the Brave makes it seem like that England's really prepped for an invasion and they immediately pounce on Jacob Crow's men when they take control of that island off the coast of Scotland. They pretty much bombard it into oblivion. They're very trigger happy and very paranoid about people taking over England and the United Kingdom. It's also strange how Luger pistols are the predominant weapons of that era, even used by the British. Even in America, in Chicago 1932, the Luger is the go-to gun. The, I mean, it's called the Kruger in Future Perfect, but it's basically the same gun, same shape and everything, basically the same model. And in Egypt in 1935, the Mauser is used by Captain Ash and the cultists. Another big thing is that there are no World War II levels in Time Splitters in any of the games. You'd think that a time-traveling space marine like Cortez would want to deal with a certain mustached dictator from Germany. Well, what if the reason he didn't was because he never took power? What if the Central Powers won the First World War? And what if they reshaped Europe and the globe to better suit their interests? Maybe World War II happened, but in a different way. I mean, it seems like it could be a case of Germany gaining more control and influence, their arms market becoming more dominant to the point where even the U.S. is buying up German guns. It would explain why, I mean, aside from pre radical not wanting to go in the, at the time, bloated World War II game market, it would explain why there's no special missions to assassinate Mussolini or Hitler or Tojo or any of the other major dictators at that time. Presumably, the Central Powers managed to defeat France and Britain and everything else, came out on top, and started influencing the globe. They could explain the circumstances of the uh, tomb level in Time Splitters 1 and why these cultists have been driven out to this abandoned tomb. Presumably the Ottoman Empire would have cracked down on them had they stayed within their borders. It's a little, again, a stretch, but I thought it was an interesting idea. I think there's some concrete evidence you can point to and say, eh, that's believable. Last on the list, Battlefront 3 bankrupted FRD not Hayes. I actually believed that Hayes completely destroyed the uh, free radical design for a while, but from what I've read that wasn't quite the case. Hayes definitely did a number to free radical design. It didn't sell as well as it could have. It made it tougher for them to try to publish games because they no longer had a clean record of games with good review scores. Now they had Haze on their hands, and they had to explain that away when trying to pitch games. Haze definitely impacted their ability to sell, but Battlefront 3 was what did them in. From about 2006-2008, Free Radical Design partnered up with LucasArts. They were making the third Battlefront game, not the one that EA released in 2015, but this was like a totally different game. Big emphasis being on space battles transitioning to ground battles. So you could like hop in a starfighter, fly through the atmosphere, and then participate in a battle between uh, the massive star destroyers and everything. They'd gotten a lot of work done on it. They had art for stuff like a Dark Psy Obi Wan Kenobi, different uh, customization for clone troopers and things of that sort. It looked really promising. They had gameplay made for it. And it seemed like they were doing good with it, but around that time LucasArts had a shift in management and the formerly good relationship they had with Free Radical kind of went downhill. They really leaned on them to get the game out as quick as possible and to cut costs. By the time 2008 rolled around, they weren't really getting paid at all. 
eventually they just sort of fell apart, and some assets from Free Radicals Battlefront 3 ended up in, I believe, uh, The Force Unleashed. They wanted LucasArts considered releasing a um, half-baked version of Battlefront 3 with what Free Radical had finished, but in the end they decided to scrap it. Some of its ideas went into uh, Battlefront Elite Squadron and Renegade Squadron. In the end, though, Battlefront 3, made by Crew Radical Design, only really exists in prototype form. You can find it online, but you need a modded Xbox 360 to be able to play it. It's a shame, because it looks really innovative, and if they only had a little more time, I think they could have gotten out a solid product. I mean, they were even working on plans for Battlefront 4. That's how much LucasArts had liked it. But it wasn't meant to be, apparently. So, in the end, Hayes did a number to free radical design, but the financial troubles for making Battlefront 3 was what ultimately brought free radical design to its knees and brought to bankruptcy. The frame perfect time splitters feature perfect code just unlocked everything. As far as what's known, at least. Importing second sight assets in a time splitter is future perfect. <laughs> Alright, with all of the regular stuff out of the way, time to include all of the bonus listings in the iceberg. This is stuff that I figured out while making the video, or that I learned through other people, but weren't featured in the image itself that I based the videos off of. So I'll go through these real quick. All of them are facts, I should note. They're interesting, and they should definitely be looked into further if you're curious. So here we go. Time Splitters 1 had vehicles in it. It's not certain whether you could drive them or not, but they had more than just the Spaceways Taxi or other things. There was a truck, a jeep, some other vehicles, they had animations. It's uncertain where they were going to be. Maybe the truck would have been docks and the jeep maybe... I don't know, maybe that would have been docks too. It's unclear. Or it could have been a chemical plant. Unused character names in Time Splitters 2. In the Time Splitters 2 game files, there are names that come up and aren't really used by characters. These include Lieutenant Jade, Witch, Barrel Robot, Rail Spider Robot, and I don't know if you can count Ramona Cortez, but she's not in that. But those are some character names that come up but never really featured in anything. There's also a level listing called Warehouse that I believe was the multiplayer version of Chicago originally. Cut Special Forces characters in Time Splitters Future Perfect. Some of the Special Forces guys from Time Splitters 2 are actually in Future Perfect. They use the bear's uh, select animation when you pick them. But when you're in game, they don't have textures and their hitboxes are really messed up. Chemical Plant in Homefront's Time Splitters 2. In the Homefront port of Time Splitters 2, there's a fully functioning version of Chemical Plant from Time Splitters 1. That level only appeared in the first game, not the second game. It's unknown how it ended up there. Uh, through some editing and tweaking, you can get it fully working and playable in different modes. It's neat. Ragdoll Physics in Time Splitters Future Perfect. Future Perfect originally featured ragdoll physics, so if you would kill an enemy, they would like fall to the ground through instead of playing a death animation. You can actually still see this in some parts of what lies below. I believe when you kill some zombies that are hung up on hooks. It looks very strange, probably because it isn't featured anywhere else, and everybody else uses a standard death animation when they're killed. Time Splitters 1 test levels. Time Splitters 1 actually had a couple test levels that are not accessible by default. They are just very basic gray blocks with black void surrounding them. They are called Test and NSA 1. The difference between them is just that in Test, you have a weird third person perspective. Outside of that, they are about the same. It's unclear what they were testing exactly. Cut game modes. 
There are some cut game modes mentioned in both Time Splitters 2 and Future Perfect. Time Splitters 2 has the bag for knockout mentioned among its files. It also has references to modes called possession and one-on-one. -on -one. I don't think they necessarily work if you enable them in-game. Future Perfect also has regeneration, leech, and flame tag mentioned in its files. It isn't clear whether they work either. Those were modes in Time Splitters 2 that didn't return for Future Perfect. Notre Dame in Arcade. Notre Dame actually has an arcade setup. It's not like Dam and Wild West though. You actually need to do some more editing to make it work. It does not have a listing in the arcade level setup by default. It doesn't really work too well either. The only spawn points for deathmatch modes are in the opening area of it. And there are other guns near the first big staircase, but they do not have any ammo for some reason. So the only way to bring other guns into it is to spawn with guns with that setting or play monkey assistance and kill some of the monkeys with different weapons. In Flame Tag and Virus, it works pretty well, where you spawn anywhere and enemies will just run around, try to tag each other or avoid each other. Ryan UK did a really good video about it that I would recommend checking out if you have more info on it. And I'll post uh, an action replay code to enable it if you're curious about trying it out. So those are some smaller aspects, some parts that are still relevant to the iceberg that I thought should be brought up. And honestly, it's neat learning all these things. Even when I thought I'd learned everything about the games, there's still more to find out. That was quite the journey, wasn't it? Honestly, I did not expect to go into so much detail or to learn so much in the process of making these videos. I mean, there was stuff that I thought I knew for certain that turned out to not be the case or to be not as I had expected when I had written up the iceberg. But I'm glad that you all stuck through. They were a serious challenge to make, but I'm happy with the way they turned out, and I'm very grateful for the interest everybody took in them. There's a lot of fascinating aspects about the Time Splitters games, about the, their development, the story behind them, inner workings of them, and just the general plot of them especially the cut content. And so that's why I was happy to be able to go into detail and explore all these different things. I'm really glad that I could geek out a bit and just talk about something I really enjoy. Hopefully you all enjoyed it too. If nothing else, then I hope this made you a little more interested in the games. Maybe you want to pull out the old copies of the games and give them another shot. I certainly wouldn't blame you. I'm doing it still these days. I'm not sure which one's my favorite. I think Time Splitters 2 would have to be it, though I still enjoy one in Future Perfect. And hopefully, if nothing else, you had fun watching. I'm glad to have made these videos, and I'm glad to have had you guys as an audience. It's been a real treat. So take care. Goodbye.